dear participants greeting from the department of architecture planning and design iit bhu varanasi and icomos nsc ich and nsc cl welcome to this distinguished lecture program for graduate students to commemorate the 41st world heritage day the international day of monuments and site conducted by the department of architecture planning and design iit bhu varanasi in collaboration with icomos nsc ich and nsc cl i architect akhil nawani shall act as the moderator for today's session today's lecture program is to commemorate the international day for monuments and sites and to engage in a dialogue with our eminent speakers about the relationship between cultural heritage climate action resilience and risk preparedness the potential of heritage must be viewed broadly with the goal of fostering social cohesion inclusion equality collective action community association with the place and its ecology and most importantly as a source of pride for communities this open lecture series is intended primarily for graduate students of architecture design cultural studies history geography and their related disciplines of study as an outreach program to increase students knowledge and interest in actively engaging with heritage professionals and practitioners before commencing the program i would like to mention that the q and a session will happen at the end after all the speakers have given their talks this will allow adequate time and opportunity to our attendees to formulate questions for our presenters you can enter your queries in the chat box while stating who would you like to address with the question i would like to welcome the head of department of architecture planning and design professor rajesh kumar sir to welcome everyone and say a few words about the department Thank, Thank you, Akhil. Thank, Thank you, Akhil. Uh, good afternoon to all of you. I would like to extend a warm welcome to all the external speakers who will be sharing their knowledge and experiences with these educated and eager graduate students regarding the challenge of climate change and its association with the preservation of tangible cultural heritage and the Indian Council of Monuments and Sites, India. for collaborating with us through national science scientific committee on intangible cultural heritage and national science scientific committee on the cultural landscape as our knowledge partner and conduct this wonderful program finally a hearty welcome to all participants who have come from diverse backgrounds and expertise and are here to gather a lot of perspective through the knowledge of such experts as we all know iit bhu varanasi has a long uh, and illustrious history having been founded by pandit madan mohan malvi ji and contributing a pioneer in education for almost a century the department of architecture planning and design was recently established to commemorate the university's centennial anniversary despite being a young and department uh, young the department of architecture planning and design has made a name of itself by winning numerous national awards for the students and staff the collaborations with the icomas india and and this expert panel adds another feather to the department's cap of accomplishment i would like to congratulate the organizing team to conduct the distinguished lecture program for graduate students to commemorate the international day for the monuments and the sites and hope that all the participants have great experience for their next couple of hours thank you very much thank you sir uh, so uh, without any further ado i would like to welcome our keynote speaker for this program professor olympia nigio uh, good evening ma'am uh, it's an honor to have you here and uh, i have the privilege to introduce you to all our participants uh, so uh, today uh, professor olympia uh, will uh, talk about the cultural landscapes in japan the intangibility as a methodological key for the conservation of the inheritance sdgs and climate change professor olympia nigio is a professor in architectural restoration at the university of pavia italy and a permanent visiting professor at hosei university in tokyo 
she has been a professor in comparative history of architecture at Kyoto University Graduate School of Human and Environmental Studies at Hokkaido University in Japan and at Universidad de Bogota Jorge Tadio Lozano, Colombia. She studied at the University of Naples, Frederico II, where she obtained the PhD, execu uh, Executive Masters at Business School, Seoul 24O, and post PhD in Conservation of Architectural Heritage. She is the director of EDA, SMP the Architectura, International Research Center, and founder of the pedagogical program RWYC, which is Reconnecting with Your Culture. Um, I would like to welcome you, ma'am. Thank you so much for gracing us with your presence. I share my presentation. Sure. Thank you very much for this uh, special um, invitation. Um, it is a very pleasure today to celebrate uh, with you the International Day of Monument and Site with uh, this special keynote dedicated to the cultural landscape in uh, Japan, where I lived um, very many years and uh, I work in, the, in uh, Kyoto, in uh, Hokkaido and uh, Tokyo. And for this reason, today is a very pleasure for me to share this my direct experience in uh, Japan about the cultural heritage, the cultural landscape in relationship also with uh, the STG and um, the problem <laughs> dedicated to climate change. Um, I want to uh, thank very much uh, e-commerce uh, uh, India and the Department of Architecture, Planning and Design of University in Varanasi. Thank you very much. Um, the first uh, um, contact of Occidental um, culture with the Oriental culture was promoted in the 17th century uh, by the religious um, community uh, because during this period uh, we can read in many, many historical books this important about and very interesting news about this uh, first contact. Above all, with the, the South of Japan. Uh, today, um, this area uh, is nominated um, Nagasaki Prefecture or Saga Prefecture. Uh, in this area, in many museums in this area, we uh, can meet, uh, we can see um, so many important documents that uh, help us to understand very well this relationship between Occidental culture and Oriental culture. And uh, these documents are very important to uh, know um, as uh, in this period, the Occidental people approach for the first time this contest, this special contest about all the cultural landscape in Japan, yeah, above all the relationship between men and nature. Um, during uh, my uh, research, my um, large uh, period in uh, Japan, I visited many, many uh, uh, prefecture, many, many areas where um, the Japanese um, office of dedicated of culture are building in uh, these last few years many um, area dedicated to ancient architecture in Japan. And above all, in the prefect Saga prefecture in this area, in the south, in Kyushu, Island, uh, we can meet an uh, interesting area dedicated to uh, historical park and uh, dedicated to, to um, show uh, the ancient architecture all um, 
example, interesting to uh, know, uh, to understand the relationship between nature and community. Uh, here we can see um, many different uh, historical park, uh, many different areas of this historical park. For example, this is an ancient temple. And also today, for example, um, in, um, uh, in Ise, Ise Temple, we continue this uh, specific um, construction, this specific technology to uh, build the ancient uh, temple, the sacred ancient temple, also dedicated to the imperial family. And for this reason, I want to share with you this image to understand this value of the historical architecture um, built in Japan, built in Japan in this, um, this last few uh, centuries, um, in dialogue with the, the um, nature and also with the, the natural materials, uh, because also today, the Japanese architecture continue um, to um, build in uh, wood and uh, with special um, natural materials, natural materials, for example, bamboo or um, a, a cypress uh, bark, etc., etc. Um, whole knowledge about uh, this uh, um, tradition, uh, this uh, specific culture of uh, um, uh, Japanese architecture is uh, preserved in uh, Kyoto and uh, above all in Nara. Nara was uh, the first ancient uh, capital of Japan uh, before of Kyoto. Uh, here, in a Toidaiji temple, uh, this is a very interesting and important temple in Nara. Uh, there is an, an interesting archive where um, are preserved many important documents um, dedicated uh, to the um, dialogue between nature and architecture. In the, this archive, we meet two important documents. Neon uh, document, uh, Chronicle of Japan. Um, this, um, this document um, was uh, um, written in the uh, 18th century. And uh, uh, Koiji Chronicle on Ancient Events, they uh, wrote it in the same um, uh, time. But in this document, we meet an important concept. We meet the concept dedicated to intangible heritage. Because this concept was introduced in Japan um, last few um, years, um, last few centuries, sorry, uh, in 1914 in the international law uh, where this law introduced for the first time this concept, but we meet already this concept in a neon shoki in in Koijiki. I want to share with you these two documents because in this document we see, we can see also many interesting drawings that help us to understand the ancient technology to build uh, houses, temples, in general, hall. Japanese traditional architecture. And it is very interesting to analyze these ancient drawings to understand this ancient technology, this ancient knowledge, this um, ancient knowledge um, is very important to understand also today 
no? The tradition of the building of the arch Japanese architecture. Um, I analyzed this document also uh, thanks my um, Japanese colleagues. And uh, I understand very well, for example, um, the uh, knowledge, the ancient knowledge that uh, Halos, the, um, a Japanese architect, Japanese craftsman, um, for realizing, for example, this specific uh, construction. In this case, it is a sacred area, but the same technology, the same knowledge um, are used use uh, for construction, for the construction of the ancient, uh, of the specific Japanese construction. But uh, it is interesting uh, to um, verify the use uh, in this, uh, also today, also today, um, for the construction of Japanese architecture, of uh, the cypress bark. This uh, specific material is used to um, build, for example, the roof of the architecture, of the Japanese architecture. But it is also very interesting to verify in Japan the uh, very many, many forests, many um, tree uh, that uh, we meet in a different part, in a different territory of Japan from the north uh, to the south in Japan. Because uh, the cypress bark is very, very important to build, to realize the roof of ancient um, temple, but also for the restoration of these ancient roofs. For example, I participate in a different restoration site uh, of the ancient temple, Agob Hall in Kyoto, where I have the opportunity to, um, to see, uh, to uh, verify directly in this restoration site, the specific technique to um, restore this important roof. Here you can see, uh, for example, the cypress um, bark and also ancient instrument to work this specific material to restore or to build uh, the roof in natural material. This is very important because um, uh, this specific technology allows us to understand the relationship between nature and construction, but above all to improve uh, the knowledge um, to improve, sorry, uh, the, uh, exactly the knowledge of this ancient uh, technology, this uh, ancient um, methodology. Because also today, many families in Japan continue this ancient technology. Many, many uh, craftsmen continue this specific technology to build, to restore, also to restore this ancient roof in a dialogue with the, the natural law, no? the natural materials. And uh, because uh, the, in Japan, do you know very well, also in India, the relationship between man and nature, it is very important. Many, many area, rural area, but also um, uh, in many important uh, big city, for example, also in uh, Tokyo, um, we, um, 
we can um, see uh, interesting ancient houses uh, realized uh, in wood and uh, these specific materials of the cypress uh, bark. Uh, for example, this is an area very near Tokyo, uh, where there are many, many important rural villages. And here we can uh, appreciate this interesting technology, this interesting methodological uh, technique applied to build these ancient these, uh, these, uh, houses, but also for restore, restoring these ancient houses. I participate with my students in Japan in uh, interesting, in many and interesting uh, restoring sites uh, where uh, we have opportunity, uh, we had the opportunity to, um, to learn more, um, more knowledge about uh, the uh, restoration, for example, of ancient um, building, of ancient construction. Um, it is uh, very uh, difficult uh, in uh, Japan uh, to uh, read, but uh, to also uh, to uh, encounter many books about uh, this knowledge, because this knowledge is a uh, oral. Uh, knowledge uh, is an uh, intangible uh, knowledge, is an intangible heritage. And uh, also um, to restore, also during this important uh, restoration site, in this restoration site, uh, we have um, uh, um, learned uh, important intangible knowledge about uh, this ancient uh, uh, construction. For example, here we are in um, in the Noto Peninsula, uh, in a very near um, Kyoto city, uh, where we have realized an important uh, restoration. This is uh, houses restored with the um, university um, in many um, very different steps. But at the end, we have realized this interesting restoration. And during this work, uh, we um, appreciated uh, very much many different knowledge that we uh, have opportunity to understand very well thanks this uh, restoration site. Uh, but another important uh, um, topic is uh, the uh, dialogue between architecture and landscape. Because another important topic is uh, cultural landscape. This is uh, an important um, issue uh, in Japan, uh, also introduced in the last uh, law, national law, uh, published in, uh, in 2004. Uh, this uh, in national law introduced uh, this concept about uh, a cultural landscape, where land, uh, cultural landscape uh, preserve, preserve at the same time uh, architecture, nature, but also the anthropological concept, the anthropological contents of uh, this uh, um, of, of this area because uh, the uh, territory is uh, transformed uh, by the uh, men and for this reason when we can speak about uh, the cultural landscape we need uh, to understand very well this uh, stratification this uh, different stratification of the transformation produced by the local community here uh, we can see um, other important ancient uh, houses. Also, this is an interesting area that uh, um, 
I analyzed um, this uh, house is, is in Sado, Island, in the north, occidental or um, north in Japan. And now this area uh, is uh, um, uh, included in the uh, list of uh, UNESCO site. Um, and I worked very much on this area to understand, above all, the specific, the ex ex um, exceptional uh, value of this architecture, and above all, the knowledge uh, relation, uh, relationed with this specific architecture. Here, also, you can see other specific rural houses um, restored in the last uh, few years. Also here, a drawing um, realized, for example, by my students, because uh, we have realized many, many specific studies on this area to understand the um, ancient knowledge and, but above all, the intangible heritage, the intangible knowledge um, from uh, many, craftsmen or also uh, many um, uh, specific, many um, people of the local community that um, improve uh, today uh, this, uh, um, this technology. Uh, here, uh, this is a specific area in Kyoto. Uh, this is an, an important uh, bamboo forest. Um, very, very near um, the Kyoto city, where um, here we can um, see many important ancient houses realized with uh, this specific use of bamboo for the um, for the uh, ancient houses and uh, um, above all uh, for the roof of the houses. Here, another specific details of the ancient houses, also here to understand uh, the ancient technology to uh, build these ancient houses. Uh, for example, here, the use of the earth uh, to uh, realize it, um, all the, the vertical construction of the ancient houses, but the use of the stone in, um, in corresponding of the pillar uh, to uh, preserve this uh, pillar of the humidity of the uh, water. But all important technology, specific technology that um, Halov has to understand also the relationship of the space, of the specific space, interior space of the houses uh, in dialogue with the nature, with the landscape. This is another important topic in a Japanese architecture because uh, this is a specific specific um, um, issues uh, to understand, for example, the significance of this interior space uh, in um, Japanese architecture, ancient Japanese architecture, in a dialogue with the, the nature and with the, the, the landscape. But uh, only uh, in 1914, Engterman of the law for the protection of cultural properties introduced this important topic, Bunzakai of Po, intangible cultural properties, uh, as an important category to understand very well the cultural heritage in Japan. But it is important now to understand that this law introduces this preservation, the preservation of intangible culture, but, but this intangible cultural property were limited to those which are in a danger of disappearance. Um, 
So today, continuing this important um, law, this, uh, this law is applied in, uh, in all uh, Japan, but uh, this, uh, um, this appearance uh, heritage is an important reference to understand the significance of the intangible cultural properties in Japan. Because the concept of the intangible heritage is um, different, for example, in a relationship with the Occidental culture. Uh, in Japan, the intangible uh, heritage is limited of the uh, disappearing uh, heritage. And this is very important because also this concept was introduced uh, in the Mexico Declaration dedicated to the cultural policies in 1922. But you know very well that UNESCO introduced only in 2003 the Convention of the Intangible Heritage. But this declaration allows us to understand very well also the concept about the culture and the importance of the intangible heritage in dialogue with the significance of culture. Each culture represents a unique and irreplaceable set of values, signs the traditions of forms and expression of each people constitute its most successful way of begin present in the world. All culture form part of common heritage of humanity, but we need to understand the different significance of culture in every country, in every community. And for this reason, now I want also to share with you other works that we are realizing in Kyoto, for example, on a specific ancient building to understand very well these ancient um, traditions and has um, these ancient traditions are applied during the restoration works. No? This is another um, restoration site that I followed during my work in Japan. And this is very interesting because this work helped me to understand very well this ancient knowledge, this ancient Japanese knowledge to restore these ancient houses. Um, for example, this is an ancient houses restored in Kyoto um, for a private family. No? This is interior design of these uh, uh, houses after this restoration. Now, uh, I um, consider this uh, important knowledge um, an important heritage, an important heritage to understand very well the dialogue between uh, landscape and construction. This is an, a, a photo from uh, Kyoto, for example, but also to introduce this last topic um, about the agenda 2030, because the agenda 2030 now uh, helped us to introduce very well uh, the importance of this dialogue between uh, very different needs, different topics, different issues of the local community in a relationship with the, the specific needs of this community. Now, during this period, 
I worked very much on two important points of this agenda 2030. Uh, the point of um, four of quality education with the, the um, uh, pedagogical program are connecting with your culture, where uh, Professor Rana P.B. Singh is uh, president for Asia of this uh, international program. And but also on this specific point, 15 point life on land, because uh, on this on this point we are realized in Japan, but also now in Italy, important project with the students. In conclusion, I want also to invite you to read many information about this important um, project promoted by Tokyo University about the Society 5.0, because this program um, allows us to understand very well the people-centered approach in this um, very complicated historical period in our commune house, but how um, uh, is the best way to continue all together now to protect, to preserve our commune house in a dialogue with the, the needs of the local community, but also in a dialogue with the natural laws. Uh, why? Because the first heritage for us is the community. The first heritage for us are the community as the local communities in the world. Um, I thank you very much for your attention and uh, I hope this uh, suggestion um, will be important uh, for you uh, to uh, continue this dialogue together uh, to preserve our commune houses. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, I hope uh, the uh, participants uh, over here will have some new fashion regarding cultural landscapes and their importance. It's always surreal to see uh, beautiful landscapes and practical restoration works in pictures always uh, because it keeps us grounded to whatever practically is happening uh, to secure and safeguard these uh, traditional heritage uh, buildings. Uh, thank you so much uh, to give us your valuable time uh, and we'll be asking the questions which are mentioned by our attendees at the end after all the speakers have uh, talks and we hope to meet you soon here and welcoming us uh, uh, we'll be welcoming you with uh, uh, to arrive to this majestic city and it uh, brings us to our next eminent speaker uh, professor rana pb singh sir uh, welcome sir it's an honor to have you here uh, so, just a short intro about our speaker. Uh, he'll be uh, today. He'll be talking about intangible cultural heritage of India, the locality, distinctiveness, and cosmo uh, cosmality. Professor Rana P B Singh is the president of R W Y C, uh, reconnecting with your culture Asia, and president of A C L A, Asian Cultural Landscape Association. He has been the professor of cultural landscapes and heritage study and the head of the Department of Geography, Institute of, Institute of Science, uh, Banaras Hindu University, Varanasi. He is researching in the fields of cultural landscapes, sacred scapes, and pilgrimage st uh, st uh, studies, heritage sites, and land. His publications include 340 papers and 43 books and anthologies uh, of these subjects. Presently, he is collaborating with Professor Olympia Liu uh, on projects related to cultural heritage, spiritual awakening, and reconnecting with your culture. Welcome, sir. Am I audible? Sure, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. So, since that uh, the first lecture before me was on Japan, so I can say Kon Banawa and uh, most welcome Arigato Gujai Master for introducing Japan which is also my second area of study that I studied since 1980. 
So that's good. I am going to give you overview of intangible cultural heritage of India, locality, distinctiveness, and personality. That how that is linked. And one point you have always to keep in mind that I will be a little bit critical in that because working in several countries and now coming to this uh, stage that uh, look, we always follow, never try to say that it is not fitting into. Several times you'll find that thing, please try to just adjust and uh, excuse me for that. Okay, so the first thing is that when we are talking about heritage, so, and uh, just now as mentioned 1920, that is perhaps the first country which has passed the heritage law at the three levels. Okay, so that is the local level, regional level, or national level, and then international level. Here, if you compare India, it has a very rich tradition to refer Dharuhara. It is translated now as heritage, and that goes to Yajur Veda and Atharva Veda description, so at least 2000 BC. Simple way to say that if you are not linking the conceptual frame with the past culture, then there will be a lot of dilemma and confusion. So simple thing is say the word is dhara, ihara. dhara that is Prithvi, and that is described uh, in detail in Prithvi Shukta of the uh, Tharva Veda. And uh, ihara in the way of identity through time. Then we have Prithvi is the word dhara, dhi, dhati, dhritahari, and we have the whole series. So if you can take the modern science, we could way to understand this conceptual frame, like what uh, Jim Lawlak has introduced, the concept of whole there, we introduced based on 6th century AD, and we have all historical base at least 10th century BC. Just to say that if you are dislinking this thing, then whole conceptual frame is going to be somewhere else. And that was the basic concept, what was introduced in 2003 in technical sense in ESCO introduced intangible cultural heritage. Later on, I will discuss this issue that uh, to what extent this is applicable in Indian context. But they have made it in a, in a very broad, very simple way to say that how it is related to the different attributes. And based on that, they have classified five groups to say these are the intangible cultural heritage based on 2003, and still that is valid. Oral tradition, then the performance arts, social practices, rituals, festive. Remember here, they have not added the word culture. Because they have no sense of culture. That is the thing. Here, everything, culture, social is coming later on. So that is the big conceptual framework. I am talking not only in India. It's whole Asia, the whole Oriental world. Knowledge and practices concerning nature and the universe and then traditional government. Okay, what we, the, according to that condition, whatever UNESCO defined and the way we have followed, India was already two terms member of the committee and recently again joined its uh, heritage committee. So this is the list based on number 2021. So there are 16, 15 such sites described uh, from India under the intangible cultural heritage. What we tried to do, a little bit in detail tried to do, and never find that these five group is fitting into Indian condition. It is something like crude way that anything you are going to put in some scale and say in the Western world, oh, here we are. But thanks God that at least in your scope people realize this. We are realizing or not that is different issue. But we have already this report in one of the UNESCO sponsored a serial monograph that at least we have 10 groups. So this way, the five, whatever UNESCO said, so we have added oral tradition performance like Ram Leela and Leela. So where is divine and human being meet together and theater is going on. Okay, nowhere in the world. It is only in Asian tradition and only in few countries. Then Parikrama, Yatras, pilgrimages, routes, which is very ancient, alive. And we know that there are three world famous such routes. That is Santiago de Compostela, Camino Samino, and then a Shikoku Island, and then in India, that is a Anshkoshiyaka. Okay, I will show a little bit. The ritual and festival, the ritual art and performance, scholastic tradition, indigenous knowledge, memorials, icons, and birthplaces, and memorials of freedom fighters, and literature, and saints, etc. Taking that basis, what we did here is an example. One example out of the total 
111 total till november 2021 government of india has defined already this is inscribed in government report as intangible heritage site on average you can say each state having about three such site but bengal having eight manipur seven Assam six, Tripura six, and then there are five such which are all scattered type. Like Kumbh Mela, two three places. Yoga is also three, five. So all together it is coming under sixty. Just to give you example, how this whole analytical frame prepared by government of India, state wise, the name, the state domain, the scripture, and then they are putting some planning perspective and what are the sources are available. So this is just like inventory register going to be prepared by this. I have cited uh, two examples. One is taking Ayodhya and another is taking Varanasi, and taking the 10 point scale. And then we have tried to plot this. This is nothing like one day work. And this is nothing like you can say one person work. That is our work, our students, colleagues, and so many such scholars involved there. This way we have prepared exhaustive list and then putting several boxes, what to be done, what is the condition, how people can participate, not only theoretical idea, but mostly based on the public participation, etc. Similarly, we have prepared for the uh, Varanasi. There are Saptapuris, seven sacred cities in India, based on the ancient tradition, we, that is going to second century BC and coming up to the seventh century, AD. So, and those seven cities having a very rich and strong traditions of all such things, what we are talking about. So, it is important that those seven sacred cities to be taken under Prashad or Hidmai or some other program just to document and then try to link with the sustainable goal or you can say new urban agenda, the smart city, whatever it may be. So that should all be part of the development strategy. So this is just to give the whole catalog system. These are the seven cities. So make it uh, this uh, basic background into the theoretical frame. So we try to understand this whole concept in the frame of what we call ritual landscape, or ritual estates in a more broader sense. So you start from mostly religious. We are also to be one, one we are writing in English saying religion, then it is always confusing. There is nothing like a religion, at least in all southern continent of this whole time. In there, or you can say Southeast or even the East. We have studied Japan, it's nothing like that religion, what is defined by church and fixed rules, etc. So whenever we are using the English terminology, we have to put a footnote and little bit clarification of the point how it is going to be taken. So you believe or not, say or not, but religion is always there in that sense. So it is more like you, you can say what you started there was international debate, that is the spiritual understanding of that. So that idea you have to keep in mind and then the whole catalog box to be prepared through theoretical models. So this is one example of what we are trying to do. Another perspective that when we are talking about the rituals or festivals or performances, they all having two very important attributes in two sides. Sacred time, sacred space, sacred function, sacred functionaries. So two are the basis and two are in between going on. So that is another perspective we are trying to develop, sacred geometrical frame of all this. So this way, you can see left hand side, that is, uh, you can say five patterns. It is start like uh, upper A, it is going upward, ascent, then suddenly downwards, then both mix together. It is just like gradual ascent and descent, like histogram and circularity. We have the detailed analysis of all this, that how from person it is going outside and then all mixed together like this. This is just to give the theoretical construction in which we can put and test and then modify and elaborate to understand what is intangibility in Western terminology. Well, in our system, that is different. Our system is asta public. No way you can easily translate. Are you can a dharma? No way easily you can translate into English. No, not at all. So when we are preparing our report and writing our papers, we always put a footnote that here is a different thing. So many things, similarities, but here is distinction also. So this is another perspective to see. So once we are going to 
from a landscape basis, here is a temporal basis to understand. Taking one example like this, now Kumamela already uh, inscribed in 2019 under the intangible list. Okay, and they said this is the biggest gathering and also it is like this, this, this. Okay, good. But if you can analyze the original text and go from the third way the text, it is also astronomical happen. This is the example of cultural astronomy received by people, perceived by people, and then maintained by people. They are highlighting only the number. So it is more physical phenomena. It is the concept of the broader, what we say, Bharatamata, something like that. So don't put anything political again like this. It is just what we call it, the Gangaization of Indian culture. So Ganga is only one, not Ganges, don't confuse. Because in English, we always say Ganges and corrupt the whole thought. There is no word in Sanskrit or Hindi or any language, Ganges. And already this is restricted under the law in 1962. But we, whenever we talk in English, we always say Ganges because our mind is controlled by colonial people. Just to please them, but I know English, we say, it's Ganges. So sorry to say, because the moment you say Ganga and then analyze the whole textual tradition, then if I bear country Ganga, the five rivers, other four rivers are also called Ganga. And this way, a typical structure you can see developed. And that is called Kumamela, the biggest human gathering for rituals, performances, dialogue, discourses without any contradiction and conflict. That is the history, at least recorded history, since we have 6th century BC, already documented itself. So this is to say that whenever we are going to say this is only intangible, but it has very strong tradition of universal message like that. For example, you see that this 2019 rush, 115 million people gathered there. This is the BBC report and then the Department of Statistics, whatever they say, like this. Just to give the intensity and level of this, how you can put only intangible? That is the question. Because whatever other intangible sites they are describing, very small scale. This is the huge scale, and this is the only scale of this size all over the world. So that's a, give a reference of this one. 45 square kilometer of area, eight kilometer long Ganga, Yamuna, Bethel, Sarsati, River Conference, 22 sectors, and full city level, every arrangement like this. 20,000 sanitation workers, 20 quantum bridge, 22 hospital, like this. This is, the, this is all the things published like this. So just to give the idea that context we have not to miss. And whenever you are saying context, then you have to go the historical cultural route to understand it. Explain these things. This is another perspective. So I am showing you just only nothing like systematic thing because such ex extreme examples. This is the Ramnagar Ramlina. This is also inscribed already intangible heritage under UNESCO. And, but uh, no Indian has written in detail from the architecture and planning perspective. Thanks to Sessional from New York State University, he has written five books on this. This is the only place in the whole world that is called environmental theater. You have to walk in that way. And nothing like modern techniques and modern tools and modern all these light system, but old traditional system going on. And millions of people watching this. This is moving 31 days for 31 sites. And they have made the miniature, it is not stage level. So again, the point is that when there is nothing like phase, it is always moving and space is fixed, time is fixed, function is fixed, X is fixed. And then how to say this is only intangible? Or you can just put in a very strict sense in this is tangible. That is the big problem. And that's why we have introduced the term, okay, thanks to in 2015, we think they have accepted, but in India, nobody talking about that. This is in between transitory, transitory IAT, transitory intangible and tangible together, keeping this tradition. That is the example of this one. And this is Ramanagar Amelia from Banaras. Here is an, another just started this year that is called based on the Ramayana tradition, how Rama is not Rama born in Ayodhya and then born to Sri Lanka. This whole route now going to be linked to 
the Ramayana. Now we start. Okay, just uh, in this month, it will start. But in the military form, already those sites have been replicated in a very condensed manner in Ayodhya, and already such things were going on. That is the another perspective that you are saying that here is a Ram Leela as intangible, then what about this? Do you think this is separate? And not separate, then where to keep it? So that is another problem, what we call cultural complexity of a particular such an ancient culture that we keep in mind. Similarly, when we are talking about pilgrimage tradition, what they have mentioned, the religious journey. This is not a religious journey. In Indian context, the Tirtiyata already first time described in 8th century BC in the Mahabharata. And already published reports are available. I should in the Mongol world from Kitish So that is another perspective. All these are linked. So going history to 1000 BC, coming up to the present era, and different stages of that, different niches of the heritage. So we have to see that what terminology and how to analyze these ones. This is another revival coming up based on that pilgrimage tradition that is Yatra Rashi Kuchi Yapra, 288 kilometers of journey that started, that was blocked during the, about 10 years ago, but thanks to the new government in Uttar Pradesh that he survived. And the chief minister himself has performed this journey for three days. And given a special program that when you are talking about Shikoku Island, when you are talking about the Agnitra Pompis, why not here? It is already going on. So such things are a unique tradition still properly not documented. It is too much for us. Then different layers of, we can say, we have the three perspectives to see these, what is called micro, meso, and macro. Macro, the more cosmic, meso, more earthly, and micro, miniature form, the pilgrimage journey going on. This is case of India. We have studied India and Varanasi in more detail, that's why example. This is the way all the ponds in Ayodhya, sacred ponds, water pool, how they are going to be activated during different type of functional religious activities. So some example like this. Now, whenever you are talking about city, it has different images. It is nothing like one image. It is unified combination of several images, like in case of Varans, in case of Ayodhya, we have more examples from those areas. So just to say that we can't say suddenly this is like, UNESCO has put a banner for Varanasi. This is a city of music. What this nonsense? Uh, only music. It means you are biased. And here, people say, oh, UNESCO has given the banner. Then what you are doing? Learn from Japanese. Japanese always having three layers. For international here, for national level here, for regional level, prefectural level here. So we have to be conscious about all this such documents. This is something unique and only one piece in the whole world. But not properly highlighted, except more scientific paper. This is based on the solar worship, Suri worship, worship of sun god in the form of mother. And that is the oldest tradition that is going at least 2000 BC. And first time it was highlighted in 1952 with Masya Okay, now we have started during the last 15 years scientific basis. We got a National Science Foundation in US project and to the University of Colorado Astrophysics and MIT in the work on this. The result is here. That on particular day, that is the 14th of January, which is called a Sankranti in Hindu system, exactly sunlight is going to touch the two signs and then radiation is going to be just reflected over the rest of the temples. This is a part of the ritual tradition. Pilgrimage, ritual, worship, etc. But they are doing only the religious gain or spiritual gain. When we have studied in that way, then you find there is a very scientific religion of basis to explain this. So this is another example that we have to put tangible, intangible, in between, or more than that, our combination of all. This is the another third one I have cited, Santiago de Compostela Terminal, and then Sikoko Island, and here is the Panchkoshi. Why I am citing this? There are 20 such Panchkoshi journey in all over India, but all corrupted, all distorted, all mixed up. This is the only, whatever we studied in the last 20 years, we find this is intact maintained as such, at least since 9th century AD, but nowhere I like it. Okay, but we have never given proposal. Thanks God that recently, just a few months ago, 
special program for innovations going on, recording going on. We have, our, of course, we have published some books, etc. So this is another. But here, the typical example in North India, this is related to progeny cult. And it's still the scientific study has been not made that why on two days in the whole year, when the sunlight directly hitting and special radiation passing on the virgin newly married couple, they go there, they take the vow, do the rituals, and the result came 60% of pregnancy. But still we are waiting that we can get this special permission to study from the medical science and the astrophysical science, how this tradition has developed. This is also not mentioned. That this is tenable or interview, no answer. Except that there some scientists already put, like Subhaska put this under the UNESCO Cultural Astronomy Group, but in Indian context, Nowhere it is written like so these are the other contradictory things that many important such things international level not such. This is another peculiar situation, which is nothing like design. It's a highly sophisticated GPS program, which were first time used with the help of Harvard University, Colorado, and the work has been done here. Look exact this triangular situation. The red one that is the mother goddess tree, and blue one that is the Shiva. We together, that is the way hexagram is developing the yantra in the whole landscape of nine kilometer journey. And that has been dated based on the inscription and geological testing that is to go to 8th, 9th century AD. Who has made this? We don't know. And millions of people throughout the year going on. Every day, 100, 200 people morning, evening, they are doing pilgrimage journey. So that is another typical example that we should keep in mind. Okay, just some tradition, just let me close by here with the view that uh, a man here, you can say left lower side, at the age of eight, he came to Varanasi and never crossed the two river Varana. And as he throughout his life, he put his whole life, he was illiterate in physical sense, but he was so enlightened person, he can tell every, about 1200 sites, all with house number and location. So under his guidance, I started for 20 years to prepare maps for the pilgrimage journey. So that, now he died three years ago. There is another tradition. Mostly we are talking about life, but here there are three centers unique in the whole world. They are dealing with the death. And Gaya is the most famous place. Harpindadana is it. Then there is tradition of the sacred religious functionaries. They're well organized functioning, those who are running. Thanks God that a new book is coming under the UNESCO program, a sponsored program to the Springer. Hindu religious functionaries and their role in sustainable development. And I contribute to Hindu system. So here is that, that how they have organized this and whole system is run. So you can say they are NGO under your terminology, or you can say community organization, whatever term you can use in English. But it is difficult to explain the real sense going on. So that is another perspective that one can keep in mind. Okay, last two more and then finish. Prashad, this is sacred food offered to God. And when God has eaten, then return back to you and you feel that now you have blessed by the God, spirit, or the good and well-being, etc. That is unique in India. Still, we have not highlighted. You only go for a structural thing or something big show, but we are not going to something like very specific. Thing. Here again, we have studied this one that how the sacred food is part of this whole universal value. That these are the six examples of the different parts of India, like Chappan hooks, 56 varieties of things all cooked in mud pot, all in the wooden things, nothing like any modern tea. And that is a whole story, nothing that, that is Jagannath Puri. So, so just to say that this model is still working, that he started in 1916, 17, when he has propounded this whole idea of civic sense, how the place to be always considered alive, place he speaks, place talks, place communicate, this whole idea of placeness, that is important in this direction. And then global understanding of what is Jena declaration, uh, we are part of that and our good friend, you know, Berlin, who is a UNESCO chair on global understanding. So we are putting this whole concept in our India. Like that what India can contribute to support such type of theoretical perspective to understand. Okay, so these are some of the suggestions and recommendations, what are to be done with the taking intangible heritage.
And this is the point what Olympia tried to start two years back, and now 27 countries are part of that, and that is UNESCO is sponsored, and now the Charter of the European Commission on that. RWYC, a visionary mission of awakening the youth to prepare for the global understanding and environmental concerns. Human services and preserving our cultural heritage in the cosmic frame of nature, culture, interfaces through the quality and deeply rooted education. I think the whole point, whatever I have missed, and dialogues, and much reappraising interconnectedness between locality and universality, then only we can understand holiness to wholeness. Okay? So now, the last thing to say, think cosmically, see globally, behave reasonably, act locally, but insightfully. Left hand side, those who are knowing this, uh, uh, Leonardo da Vinci, what do we have? Man, the most complicated, the most scientific, the topmost, the only one such sketch in the whole world. The scientists have written on this. Pretty of Capra's famous book, The Scientific Mind of uh, Leonardo, that is based on only one this. And I have been fortunate enough that for seven years I have worked there in Milano, going underground where the original serve. So that gives the idea that how we are going to sustainable development target 11.4 making holy heritage city vibrant and livable center of global harmony, spiritual awakening, peace and deeper understanding where ICH, intangible cultural heritage, has to play a distinct role in developing and maintaining urban cultural landscape. Okay, so Satyam Shivam Sundaram, we have to follow the truthful, to be worthyful, beautiful for peace and lovely cosmos and our all friendship. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, this session was uh, very beautiful and very informative. The intangible part of the Indian cultural heritage is a fascinating ocean of knowledge, which requires a deep understanding and complete surrender and respect towards the spirituality of our culture. Uh, I would like to invite the participants to type any questions or doubts uh, you have in the chat box, and we will attend to those towards the end of the session. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for uh, okay. this lecture. How to close uh, this. So, uh, our next speaker is an architect, a building conservationist, researcher, and writer with three decades of domestic and international experience. Uh, I would like to welcome architect Poonam Verma Mascarenas. Welcome, ma'am. Uh, uh, today, ma'am will be enlightening us with uh, uh, about uh, climate risk and urban planning in retrospect and prospect. Uh, a small uh, brief intro about architect Poonam Verma Mascarenas. Uh, she is the founding director of the Goa-based award-winning studio Arkinova Environs. She is a Charles Wallace Fellow and has extensively worked in Jaipur, uh, Goa, Kerala, Kurg, and Oroville. And her recent, uh, recent product, uh, projects include the rehabilitation of Shimla Town Hall, and the conservation of historic urban precincts and buildings in Mandi, Himachal Pradesh. She is also the co-founder of Goa Heritage Action Group and serves on the first scientific council steering committee of ICOMOS India and on the Senate of SPA Vijayawada. She has lectured both nationally and international uh, conferences such as in US, Italy, Korea and Nepal. She is the author and contributor of numerous titles and books related to traditional buildings and on conservation and planning, latest being the Map Heritage of Panji, Goa, published in 2018, and Water Culture Connection, a conservation-led integrated development strategy for water to meet SDG 6, Clean Water and Sanitation, in Volume 80 of International Gen Journal of Acoustics and New Habitat. So I would like to welcome uh, architect Poonam Verma Maskarin as well. Thanks so very much, Professor Thank Akhil. Um, my screen is visible. I am audible. Yes, sure. Yes, ma'am. Let's begin. Sure. Uh, the two presentations before us uh, have been very expansive. We got to know a lot more about what is intangible in terms of tangible. Uh, in my understanding, breaking it up into two parts is where um, Asian countries face a lot of difficulties. Our lives 
we uh, are not trained to think in terms of a uh, difference between something we are thinking and other thing that we are doing. So I'd like to share with you my thoughts and I have pegged it with the idea of climate risk preparedness using intangible cultural heritage, specifically with urban planning. Let us begin. Is the slide moving, if it would allow? Yes. The earliest presence of humans on Indian subcontinent dates back one lakh years. Beginning at the new now World Heritage Site called Bhimbetka, which is in MP. And these cave dwellings whose real significance was discovered only in the 1970s. Medieval India saw subsequent centuries of demolition and material reuse for new construction. Additionally, the pattern of assimilation, appropriation, adaptation, adoption, and fusion has continued to shape the built environment through the subsequent Mughal and colonial periods. Mr. Sham Chinani was amongst the first activists who initiated the heritage conservation movement in India in 1977. He had been an active in getting the Mahabaleshwar Panchkani belt declared an eco-sensitive zone. Shyam Chanani, who passed in 2010, was one of the India's most fearless, principled, and effective fighters for public good. He was at the heart of Bombay Environmental Action Group, to which Bombay, now Mumbai, owes almost all of its remarkable heritage protection, both natural and built. Being a lawyer perhaps gave him the insight that legislation is the key to long-term protection and the very first heritage regulations for Greater Bombay came into force on 1st June 1995. Shyam realized that the action group's success in Mumbai could be emulated elsewhere in India. And this led to legislative initiatives in Pune, Mahabaleshwar, Goa, Hyderabad, Ahmedabad and elsewhere. INTAC was set in 1984 it had its unprotected heritage charter in 2005 and its latest state of built heritage where I have contributed a chapter is uh, published in 2021, worth looking at. Now come to Goa. It's a very special and is rich architecturally from its past, nestled between Arabian Sea and on the West and the Western Ghats in the East, Goa is endowed with nature's beauty with 160 kilometers of coastline, seven major rivers, three of which are navigable, several islands, backwaters, and one of the best natural harbors in the whole of Southeast Asia. The beaches and the sea, along with European looking brightly colored buildings, churches, and huge temple complexes has made it popular tourist destination. While history of Goa dates back to the late upper Paleolithic period, while we also have Mesolithic engravings found on the river Kushavati, said to be 10,000 years old, and is now on UNESCO tentative World Heritage List, as we got to know last week. The recent documented history of Goa can be dated to the 10th century, when Goa was ruled by the kings of Kadamba dynasty. Goa was consequently under Vijayanagara kingdom, Islamic rulers from Deccan, Portuguese rulers from overseas. Since its liberation from Portuguese in 1961, it has been widely promoted as a tourist destination for both foreign and domestic tourists. Let's also look at the legislative context. So we have Urban Development Department, which creates development plans for 20 years, Town and Country Planning Department, long-term regional plans, Town and Country Planning Act, which is 1974, land use legislation, responsibility of each state and declaration of heritage conservation areas. And then we have municipality. In terms of legislative context, we have so many acts, Forest Conservation Act, environmental, coastal regulation, environmental protection, and then Archaeology Survey of India, AMSAR Act amended in 2010, as well as State Department of Archaeology has its Goa Damandu Ancient Monuments, Archaeological Sites and Remains Act 1978, rules of 1980. With that context, 
let's also look at the very important constitutional fundamental duties. It shall be duty of every Indian citizen to protect and improve the natural environment, including forests, lakes, rivers, and wildlife, and to have compassion for living creatures. Amongst other key, there came the Constitutional 73rd Amendment Act, passed in 1992, that came into force in 1993, and it was meant to provide constitutional sanction to establish democracy at the grassroots levels, as it is the state level or national level. Among other key objective, one is to promote bottom-up planning, for which the district planning committee in every district has been accorded a constitutional status with clear mandate of inclusive, integrated, and participatory planning for both managing resources and spatial development. The 74th Amendment made similar provision related to urban local governance or the Nagar Palika. The interrelationship of these various sectors that together impact our living environment fueled my interest in the regional plan for Goa. The regional plan RP 2011 was delayed and got notified only in August 2006. It was in an architect's office that the decoding of the land use as stipulated in the document began. It was an exercise in color coding the mapping and the land use, settlement, orchard, commercial one, commercial two, etc. The resultant map when overlaid on Google Earth map was a shock to say the least. The marshes, forests, notified and private, mangroves, kazans, and even the coastal lands, which would be governed by CRZ, had been given settlement status in large chunks. With no substantial demographic shift in the state, one had to wonder at the logic of such a major alteration. But why were we, the architects, the planners, designers, writers, artists, accountants, farmers, teachers, musicians, so concerned? Well, some of us in the early exposure of the, had the early exposure of the movement that began in 1992 called the Rio Summit, Earth Summit, wherein Oroville had made a representation and brought back with them many of the research and movies. Remember, that was in a pre-internet era. Goa, with its 160 kilometer coastline and seven major rivers, three of which are navigable, several islands and backwaters, is at high climate risk with projected one meter sea level rise, an intangible idea rooted in climate modeling pertaining to melting glaciers, when projected onto Goa's map, becomes a very scary tangible reality. Coupled with increased in annual rainfall from current three meter average in four months of monsoons and threat of cyclones that became very real for the very first time last year in 2021, we can infer that our collective anguish had a very firm footing in climate change science. And thus in 2006, numerous public meetings were held and information on the implication of the proposed RP 2011 was shared widely and culminated in massive rally in 2006 December. The opposition by the people of Goa led by Goa Bajao Abhyan forced the government of Goa to revoke the notified regional plan 2011 for go in 2007. A task force was set up and the draft RP 2021 was notified in 2008 and it has many new headings now. Eco-sensitive zones one and two being of great interest for it not only mentions the nature as heritage but also views built heritage as an important resource. Personally, while facilitating the review of draft plan by Village Para, power of mapping and empowerment of citizens became a very profound experience. The motivated villagers, residents required some technical advice and hand holding on the process of mapping. And soon they had marked all the missing information which was from the one is to 5,000 to one is to 1,000 in a group of four and more. And they were able to map everything about their village onto it. Then came the projected land use changes were marked and aspirations discussed and consensus were reached on various aspects. 
FAR, widths of roads, commercial areas, institutional areas, protected areas, no development areas, so on and so forth. And guess what? Look at the legend. In terms of heritage to be revered and protected, along with many buildings and ponds, there is a whole list of banyan trees, waterways, nesting areas, nature trails, animal paths, canals, which I'm sure many of us professionals would have missed. This, to the citizens of Para, became an exercise that facilitated the ownership of the development. The key word is the ownership in this scenario, it translates into a collective responsibility. The peer pressure ensured the shift from my plot to the well being of my village. And this is the key to our collective future. Resilience against climate risk will need a collaborative effort. In present era, the public participation in planning process is one of the major cornerstone, as it is the behavior of the humans that must change from exploitative living to caring and nurturing. An understanding of planning as a tool for regulating change, managing resources, and shaping of collective future is at the heart of urban planning. So why are we discussing village development plan? Well, here is another story, and this is the map of another village of Goa, which is Seol Goa. In reality, this is what it looks like as a Google. And historically, it has three boundaries, Adil Shah city boundary, Portuguese era boundary, outer fort wall from Kadamba period. Not only that, it is home to seven of the World Heritage Site monuments, while it contains 14 other centrally protected heritage sites. If we put all those onto the village map, this is what the footprints look like. Along with that, our research, our field survey revealed, okay, there are seven more, state protected, another nine monuments, unprotected heritage, 17 of them, with 13 becomes 20, 30 monuments, 30 places which are not even mentioned anywhere other than, and then there are these non-existing structures which are actually archeological sites based on our literary survey, gave us information and referencing this historic map of 7078, when we put all this information, this is what it looks like. These many places, you have ASI protected monuments, state protected monuments, unprotected monuments, archeological sites, etc. And so we decided to bring this in public domain. People should know what the place is meant to be, while the village plan did not give them any of this information. And we also prepared the village plan. We revised it, gave it the boundary as per AMSA, gave the boundary of protected as well as uh, the, the 200 meter line and 100 meter line and protecting and most of it. And what, guess what? Also the river lines, also their buffer zones. You see the difference when you put all the information, which is very important based on natural features of the sites of the place of the village, very critical map changes. And yet it is pending notification. Now, what did it lead to? In 2020, a site right within the protected area and a protected site was given a permission to build a house of a political honcho. And this is where everything starts, <laughs> that where the, the criticality of having good village plans and urban plans and the planning to be accurate becomes so, so vital. It again led to uh, public outcry. Back onto the streets, massive rallies, once again, citizens are at the front of it, culminating in cancellation of permissions, but the demolition order, the ultimate demand of the citizen is still awaited. If the village plan, as notified by TCP, had all the information on it, such gross illegality, corrupt practices could never have happened. 
Fundamentally, we founded Goa Heritage Action Group in 2000 to counter this culture of appropriation and to pursue the government of Goa to bring into fold of protection, unprotected, built and natural heritage. And before I go further, it is not just about the illegal illegality of this particular site. The implication of this house at that plot, at the, that so close to the river, is that this is the lowest lying area of the village. This is where the three meter water drains. And this is what the land is as a um, cushion, as a absorber of all the excess water. And that is the reason why all of the monuments of from 500 years, 510 and before are lasting because their foundations are safe. The water drains away from their foundations. So this, this kind of concretization can lead to massive threats to all existing, not only the heritage, but people who are living in this village, to their livelihoods, to their uh, uh, agricultural practices. So moving on, mapping is an important aspect of planning. It's a tool to comprehend a spatial reality of a city. While listing is qualitative, mapping is quantitative. Thus, in 2015, when I decided to take stock of the heritage of Panjim, again after a decade, this time we also mapped all of it. From 2005 to 2017, Panjim lost 124 heritage buildings. But more importantly, it has 907 as survivors, and as many amongst them are now refurbished, earning a living through adaptive reuse, and all this without legal protection. Primarily, it is the result of awareness drive that made the residents, owners, and visitors see the value and appreciate the resilient ensemble. And the latest outline development plan of Panjim has much enhanced conservation zone and accrued benefit of our published research in public domain. Well, same is not the case with most of our cities with historical. Further, I would argue that sensible ownership of our built environment appears to be completely missing as is evident from the ongoing superimposition of 21st century building techniques and building materials. We seem to be compelled to build at the fastest pace and with least creative inputs for maximum gain in non-recyclable materials filled with chemicals and in leading to massive demolitions of traditionally built buildings, which not only are carbon neutral, but are repository of resolved technical solutions from an era of low energy living, as many are from the non-electricity living designed for the climatic context in renewable materials, which is exactly what our planet currently demands from us low energy consumption. Today, we are flooded with information and access to COP, IPCC, proceedings, and many more such acronyms. But our decision-making process, another intangible, remains uninformed, callous, and in denial of a tragedy that is now imminent. About one lakh is the estimated number of unprotected heritage building mentioned in the latest Niti Ayog report. Reality of existing traditionally built building must be many folds. As we all know, not all traditional buildings are deemed heritage. But in this era of climate risks, it is a valuable opportunity as they are carbon neutral. If each could be repaired, retrofitted, conserved by arresting decay and adding design adapted to new use, we can really reduce new carbon on our footprint. Up to 60% of carbon emissions are accorded to built environment. And with us being the second largest population in the world, our carbon emissions are now third largest in the world. Traditional system of land management. And this is the key to it. Conservation as climate pathway. Embodied energy of existing building can be put to good use if each could be repaired, retrofit, conserved by arresting decay and adapted to new use. 
Let's look at the natural system. The traditional system of land management, such as Kazan, by the way, that is unique to Goa in the world, offers us an insight into designing with nature. This system, which evolved at least 3,000 years back, yes, 3,000 years back, is the epitome of human ingenuity and key to sustenance of the people called Goa. A circular economy generative system ensured creation of tenable land, food and livelihood, while safeguarding the population against vagaries of nature has been in decline by design. Since the liberation of Goa in 1961, killing of mangrove forests inundation of Kazan fields and filling of low-lying lands, all to build second homes or third homes for the super rich, is the personification of egocentric, self-centered Indian that seems to have pervaded all sections of society in the last two decades post-economic reforms. This intangible too must change if we are to have a hope for the coming generations. To conclude, I believe planning with nature and designing with the climatic context with indigenous materials are two most valuable in study of the built character, right? And we should accept the need for upgradation of infrastructure, but it has to be done creatively and sensitively. Development that is ecologically appropriate. I think this is so, so important and learning from the past is what we have been saying. The characteristic feature of traditional settlements, any you can see in all of India, was their ecological equilibrium, often not recognized and thus easily destroyed by contemporary insensitive interventions. And the development that reduces dependence on material skills and technology external to the area, area distinctiveness, what Ranaji was talking about, the sense of place, what uh, Professor Olympia was talking about, the cultural landscapes. There is a need for reviving the traditional building methods with locally available materials. Why? To reduce carbon travel and save the planet. Every small little bit counts. And the coordinated implementation is the most important where time for working in silos is over. The government needs to revamp its administrative structure and we need to demand it. And it's administrative and creatively harness the potential of all its employees. And you know what I'm talking about. Somebody comes and paves the road, next person cuts the road and lays the cable. Every day, every, everywhere, every single place, we see it for years together. It's a waste of carbon. And the curtail all duplication and bridge the gaps, every small little bit counts. And same is desirable for our institutions of learning. You are a new department, think about it. How can you bridge the gap? How can you change and, and approach it in this climate change era? Climate risk preparedness, using intangible cultural heritages, knowledge, resources, demands of us, that the relationship between caretaking, commodification is explicitly balanced. Land, rivers, fields, forests, and all traditionally built buildings are valuable resources, not commodities, not a waste uh, product to be thrown away. Citizens in democracy are not subjects to be ruled, but co-participants in shaping the future of the country. And we professionals are citizens first. And we really need to have to take more ownership. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, so it's always a refreshing perspective to see the development and challenges of such a culturally rich place and how uh, the aspect of climate change uh, is inconspicuously ignored. And uh, that can hamper our opportunities in the long run. Uh, I would like to thank you again for this informative session, especially the uh, impact of uh, changing of people's uh, notion from plot to village was something very interesting. And uh, it gives us hope that if uh, tried, then maybe people can also look at a collective good, uh, which uh, helps the overall society. Uh, so again, I would like to invite participants, if they have any questions, they can write it on the chat box. And we'll attend to those at the end of the session. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. So <laughs>
Our uh, next speaker is a leader who has been instrumental in bringing another feather to the cap of the Indian historical conservation uh, by enlisting the Kakatiya Rudreshwara, uh, or also known as Ramappa Temple in Telangana, India, as the recognized as a recognized UNESCO World Heritage Site. Please welcome Professor G S V Sunarayan Murthy, sir. Sir. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Good evening. So uh, we all welcome you to participate as a speaker for this program. A brief intro about the speaker. Uh, doc, uh, Professor G S V Sunarayan Murthy, sir, is a practicing conservation architect. who is currently the professor of architecture in jbr college of architecture hyderabad he is an independent consultant in the field of architecture conservation planning and urban design with an approach of reuse recycle restore appropriate use and maintain as principle of design planning and execution of projects across india under his proprietary organizations of kshetra and uh, sdm Uh, he is specialized in documenting the indian traditional buildings and historical building knowledge systems and was the trainer and capacity building facilitator with the government of andhra pradesh as assistant professor hot co chair at the center of urban development studies he is currently the south zone representative and also the coordinator of nsc on cultural landscape of icomos india his technical writings on traditional architecture and conservation has been published in national and international magazines journal and press and as i had previously mentioned in july 2021 uh, the ramampa temple in telangana india got the recognition as unesco world heritage site, uh, site status under his leadership so we welcome you sir for this lecture thank you very much uh, thank sir you. Uh, for uh, your uh, introduction um uh, the ground uh, has been uh, set uh, for me by uh, professor olympia uh, professor rana pb singh and also uh, architect uh, poonam verma and uh, the just the previous presentation and professor rana pb singh and professor olympia demonstrates the diversity of uh, asian heritage asian cultural heritage and also in particular india's diversity as we have seen the definition of uh, um, intangible and uh, heritage itself by professor rana p bissing uh, connecting to various uh, notions and uh, i uh, ideas and the realities of perceptions about uh, place and place making including uh, the concept of spirit and spiritual uh, uh, places and uh, more practically uh, to um, we have seen just now the uh, goa uh, initiative um, goa's initiative in uh, uh, listing uh, and uh, Uh, moving towards uh, people participation and emphasizing uh, towards uh, um, inclusiveness in uh, the entire planning process i will be demonstrating uh, uh, three case examples under uh, um, uh, landscapes of india when we talk about cultural landscape uh, there is uh, certainly a lot of diversity in uh, perception and understanding required when it comes to uh, spiritual uh, places and when it comes to uh, the places of uh, uh, urban uh, uh, setup and historical places um, and key to all this understanding as we have seen in our previous uh, presentation is uh, uh, people people and community and uh, professor olympi also has highlighted that uh, community is the uh, first uh, uh, point uh, to be referred as heritage so community is the key culture is the key uh, towards uh, be it planning be it uh, management and uh, uh, overall uh, 
understanding of uh, uh, places. I will be demonstrating those historic towns, uh, uh, three historic towns in India, um, where I had opportunity to work uh, professionally in these places, uh, um, along with my colleague Abdul Bari. And we had uh, made this presentation earlier um, under the similar theme of uh, uh, the role of intangible cultural heritage. Uh, mainly when we are talking about uh, uh, historical landscapes, uh, heritage, tangible heritage. So what is the role of intangible cultural heritage? Oh, uh, yeah, so the intangible cultural heritage as per uh, UNESCO, if you see, uh, uh, it includes all kinds of representations, expressions, knowledge and skills. Yeah, so this intangible heritage uh, uh, um, includes uh, um, the instruments and objects and artifacts associated with the communities and uh, uh, groups. Um, and these are manifested um, in terms of oral traditions, expressions, uh, social practices, rituals, festive events, um, traditional craftsmanship, knowledge and practices concerning uh, uh, nature and universe, uh, which were highlighted uh, by Professor uh, Rana Pibis Singh and also Professor Olympia. And identity in cultural landscapes uh, uh, um, is defined by uh, primarily um, uh, by three uh, aspects, uh, uh, the people uh, working on it, on the place, living in the place, living with the place, and uh, people who lived at that place. And time is uh, uh, both historical time and also the current time. So the people plus uh, uh, place plus time is the uh, identity that gets defined in cultural landscape uh, of a, a place. And the power of a place uh, as per uh, historian dollar is uh, uh, the capacity of places to uh, stimulate a sense of cultural belonging um, and the power of ordinary urban landscapes to uh, nurture citizens. That is, uh, uh, it, it also contributes to public memory uh, and uh, shared time, shared territory, shared boundaries. And intangible, I'm, as I said, I'm uh, showing these three places. On the left, uh, you see uh, Shah Jahanabad, where uh, um, a very uh, significant uh, um, uh, change, uh, uh, or major change is uh, uh, happening in the location in terms of urban uh, revitalization. On the right side is uh, uh, Charminar, uh, Hyderabad area, where uh, Charminar pedestrianization project uh, uh, is uh, taking shape. Um, on the um, right uh, bottom, I'm showing uh, Amritsar, Golden Temple area, um, where uh, um, to define the identity of the location and place, um, the uh, government took up uh, uh, a major initiative of uh, creating identity in the location. So that, that uh, um, uh, shows uh, um, the, the change in the area is not just only the physical change. Uh, it is required to be connected with the people activities. People, uh, the, the activities that uh, uh, keep happening. So th these activities are connected to various intangible elements, um, the craft, the food, and the sounds uh, that keep happening in the area. So uh, the moment you reach to a place uh, because of the sound, you recognize that you are uh, in that place. Uh, so these are not uh, defined uh, physically by looking at, um, it, is, it is a physics, uh, but it is not directly as a architectural, um, the physical reality, which can be seen with your eyes is not. Uh, uh, so these elements are closely connected to the identification of the place, 
memory of the place and uh, time bound connections whether it is happening in the morning in the afternoon or whether it belongs to 15th century 10th century uh, the remote past as uh, was highlighted uh, um, very rightly um, also mentioned by uh, our my previous speakers uh, the sustainable development goals uh, especially the 11th one sustainable cities and communities highlights that participatory integrated and sustainable uh, human settlement planning and management and strengthening efforts to protect and which is uh, very much uh, uh, important and uh, highlighted by my previous speaker so we need to understand that uh, these are required to be integrated and spoken and uh, maintained and managed at the people level at the community level uh, though we are addressing directly uh, physical realities uh, in front of our eyes uh, the landscapes can be understood landscapes can be managed only when we integrate with people democratic values and the true democratic values in terms of participatory and uh, inclusive uh, uh, approaches and which was uh, also mentioned by professor rani rana pb singh in a different uh, uh, manner uh, without understanding uh, um, the um, the spirit of the place because the spirit of the place uh, is the identity of the place in the memory of uh, uh, of the people so it is required to be connected very carefully so the new urban agenda uh, 2016 of uh, habitat 3 also if you see uh, sustainable leverage of uh, natural and cultural heritage uh, is required to be looked at uh, in uh, cities and uh, uh, our places and leveraging cultural heritage for sustainable urban development and recognizing its role for uh, uh, stimulating participation and responsibility this is the most important thing so when we are taking actions whether it stimulates participation whether it stimulates responsibility responsibility because uh, um, um, by doing uh, um, participatory management alone will not uh, uh, complete our actions towards uh, sustainable management it can be sustainable only if it uh, ensures um, or um, stimulation of participation stimulation of responsibility so in, the, in any place the the three places what i have just now shown um the uh, dynamics of uh, um, a place with respect to economics uh, around the place uh, culture around the place uh, the places uh, how they take shape in terms of governance in terms of redevelopment in terms of tourism in terms of local business and it is a cycle and uh, people may start uh, some actions uh, towards tourism they may end up uh, uh, realizing that it is not just only tourism it is the people who are living in that place uh, are more important and uh, tourism is a product or by product that keeps happening in the, the periphery uh, and in some places only tourism uh, pilgrimage tourism uh maybe the central to the whole sustenance of the place so um, the tourism is uh, supporting the local business and it supports uh, um, the parking needs in the area uh, in our places in all the three cases where hyderabad shahjanabad and amritsar um, none of these places were uh, uh, planned towards uh, uh, heavy vehicular uh, Uh, traffic and motor uh, vehicle traffic unfortunately uh, in the case of hyderabad if you see uh, the major road uh, connecting uh, charminar to uh, new city uh, was a uh, 100 feet wide road uh, as uh, uh, planned 100 years ago um, so um, when there was no motor vehicle uh, the motor vehicle was just entering after 20 years after the planning of that particular road and many of the roads in shahjanabad area were never planned for motor vehicle so they are undergoing transformation 
Chara uh, Hyderabad was uh, towards the pedestrianization project. Shahjanabad, uh, we have seen uh, the main road uh, uh, connecting uh, um, uh, Shahjanabad uh, road uh, um, uh, to Lal Kila uh, has been uh, uh, re redeveloped. And Amritsar also, the core center leading to Golden Temple uh, had been uh, uh, redeveloped where I was uh, uh, part of uh, some of the activities there. And in all these places, the street vendors are considered to be uh, a hurdle by most of the planning authorities. But street vendors uh, contribute to the life there. And there is also an existing uh, uh, um, built heritage and streetscape uh, around the place. And there are uh, uh, needs of uh, modernization uh, pressure, pressures, needs um, expressed by authorities, uh, executed by authorities, various authorities in these places uh, towards uh, um, uh, modernization. And there are regulations uh, in place, but they need to be re-looked at because they were all uh, addressed only from the perspective of planning. They, they were heritage was always uh, uh, viewed as uh, uh, some kind of a um, uh, zone or a small uh, dot in the overall planning. Uh, heritage was always not as a physical reality uh, going to the identification level, planning level, listing level, mapping level, as uh, we have seen in the case of Goa. So that unless we have that kind of a map and database and participation, they are viewed uh, the regulation uh, um, regulations that exist in these places cannot uh, resolve uh, towards uh, consideration of intangible uh, heritage and physical uh, heritage and the governance plays a major role um, and political uh, uh, both political and executive uh, plays a major role which is required to be understood and uh, um, discussed uh, the capacities at those levels also uh, requires modification and orientation. Uh, otherwise, uh, these redevelopment activities uh, uh, will uh, run into uh, top-down uh, uh, approach or bottom-up approach uh, is uh, whether bottom-up approach uh, is more important. So we, we will be able to realize uh, uh, when we uh, look at intangible heritage, that bottom-up approach only is the uh, solution and key uh, for these kind of uh, uh, place interventions. Though the interrelationship very clearly demonstrates that people and culture is central to the whole thing. So the um, tools and strategies, what we need to take up, this was, uh, uh, I would like to highlight that this was uh, uh, about 20, 20 years ago. Uh, the plan was undertaken. Uh, the plan uh, was executed uh, uh, by, uh, prepared by uh, our Professor Nalini Thakur, along with uh, Vasashilpa consultants. Professor Nalini Thakur was also involved in this Charminar pedestrianization project, uh, where uh, pedestrianizing the central portion of Charminar area resulted in various projects around Charmina. And all these various projects uh, were related to, most of them were related to uh, community-oriented uh, modifications. Uh, the place modification, street vendor modification, parking level modification, uh, vehicular rerouting of uh, the entire area. So these are not just only physical changes, but uh, people adopting to and modifying to in order to preserve and maintain uh, the identity of these places appropriately uh, towards future. These are some of the, um, uh, and there are uh, various approaches uh, followed, uh, limiting uh, the um, uh, vehicular traffic uh, towards Charmina and uh, um, putting, uh, barricading it, and slowly getting transformed into further uh, aesthetic lines later. So what, what happens uh, when uh, the pedestrianization is uh, uh, addressed as a touristic uh, uh, approach of uh, planning is uh, you will have tourists 
coming and uh, viewing at uh, charminar and uh, surroundings and places so it, it gives an approach of uh, uh, tourist centric planning but what happens to the real activity that keeps happening annually uh, in these places apart from tourists uh, uh, during ramzan all this one month uh, entire one month uh, the whole uh, uh, street uh, gets a complete festive atmosphere and during uh, processions of uh, muharram and during uh, processions of ganesh chaturthi uh, all these uh, areas uh, uh, acquire different significance when you see more number of people and when these more number of people are not considered as part of the overall program so i uh, if they are considered uh, to the overall program and planning then it becomes uh, uh, a real identity of the place jama masjid uh, uh, precinct uh, also similarly uh, redeveloped uh, shahjanabad one one of the architect pradeep sachdeva was uh, working on it my colleague uh, mr abdul bari was uh, working part of this uh, that is how i have included this case study um jama masjid these were some of the images uh, developed in the uh, jama masjid project and now the coming to the third one amritsar uh, facade improvement project so uh, the government of uh, punjab uh, planned to uh, create um, the facade that you see on the top uh, to be uh, modified into some kind of a uniform without uh, uh, adding too much of uh, um, uh pasting of uh, um, any of the features but maintaining the existing uh, uh, structures outline and everything adding color and uh, uh, features to the um, uh, to the components of the building the road leading towards uh, golden temple was maintained and redeveloped in um, as part of the uh facade improvement uh, uh, project and this was in participation with the public and uh, there were consulted the public was also consulted they were negotiated with and why they need to maintain uh, uh, some kind of a uniform uh, signage and uniform uh, facade and uh, the clumsy boards and uh, clumsy cables uh, uh, to be removed so that uh, whatever the portion of architecture is visible that could be presented to the street appropriately without compromising uh, the needs and uh, purposes of uh, these uh, shops leading to jallianwala bag and also golden temple in amritsar area and this was a proposal to the same uh, uh, structure and this is what uh, uh, it was uh, uh, before uh, uh, it was uh, prepared for uh, renovation as you would see uh, there are uh, the skyline and if you see the skyline and if you see the components of the buildings there are features of um, architecture uh, defining the identity of the place but they are hidden behind the boards cables and uh, the um, uh, kind of colors uh, used over the uh, buildings but that could be brought out by uh, making a simple uh, uh, change in colors and following a code uh, which is uh, part of uh, these uh, structures only uh, was defined as you would see uh, this is how that was transformed so nothing major has been added to this if you see the previous one and uh, the current one so it, it it is defining and now it is the real site where the whole uh, uh, area has got little bit of uh, identity and not not much has been added only the color uh, has been uh, improvised and it is presented to the street this is another image and how it is uh, transformed um, the same uh, location so this is uh, one of the processions uh, uh, during uh, uh, muharram uh, in charminar area similar processions happen uh, 
uh, during Ramzan and also when the, uh, there is a lot of festive uh, uh, shopping uh, that happens during Ramzan and uh, there are processions during Ganesh Chaturthi and, uh, um, and there is a daily uh, activity of uh, movement uh, uh, within the area. So all these uh, become uh, very important uh, rather than just only looking at uh, uh, as a um, charminar, as a commodity towards tourism. Uh, because these are the daily uh, and uh, uh, periodically and annual uh, uh, activities connected with people and intangible uh, connections, uh, intangible heritage uh, connections uh, uh, happening around uh, these places. This is uh, again Amritsar after the modification. So um, with this, uh, I am uh, um, coming to the closure of my uh, presentation. Uh, what I have uh, uh, tried to highlight is uh, uh, connection to the um, activities and life of people is uh, uh, key to the um, to any development uh, processes and plans that we have for heritage and especially in historic towns. And that is central to the uh, whole, uh, that should be central to the whole process of uh, 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 planning and uh, management. With this, I conclude my presentation and thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much, sir. Uh, a splendid talk which encapsulated the various lenses of historical context, intangible cultural heritage and sustainability. Uh, it was a truly enriching session for our participants. And again, uh, we, uh, we looked at the practical examples of how did uh, these heritage spaces got uh, transformed into a more, uh, to make it more sustainable. So uh, now I would like to invite the final speaker for our program. Uh, it's Dr. Uh, he's Dr. Venu Go B. Venu Gopal. Uh, welcome, sir. Uh, so glad to have you here as part of this program. And uh, a small intro about Dr. B. Venu Gopal. Uh, he has been working for 31 years in museums as former director of two prestigious museums in India, the National Museum of Natural History in New Delhi, and Indian Museum in Kolkata. He also established regional museums of natural uh, history in Mysore and Bhopal. Dr. Venu Bhopal, his training in museology from India and you. On intangible heritage studies in India at the Sri Sankaracharya University of Sanskrit, Kaladi, Kerala. Uh, I welcome you, sir, uh, for uh, this presentation. Namaskar. And I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me, as well as I'll be happy to interact with the viewers in a later stage, etc. Uh, welcome to my presentation. I have divided my presentation into three parts. The first deals with the backdrop of KHRI. That is a, a project of the Kerala Heritage Rescue Initiative launched by the ICOMOS and ICROM. That will be followed by uh, two case studies of craft resilient community. And leading to this case studies, a terminology for resilient heritage, call it resitage. Now, as a backdrop to the whole event of Kerala Heritage Rescue Initiative. It is a project, as mentioned, on cultural heritage launched by the ICOMOS and ICROM on the aftermath of the 2018 Kerala flood. Within a short span of few days, or you could say one or two weeks, the local ICOMOS members could galvanize support from such international agencies like ICOMOS and ICROM. Normally, that was not possible with a government agency because of the professional interest, etc. The project 
was projected in the latest website of the ecrom as well the some of the details are already available and they projected some time when they start new courses etc recently they uploaded the photographs of the project as well this is the i told you the ecrom oriented ecommerce oriented so two international level agencies concerned with heritage and conservation has been brought to the picture in the aftermath of the huge disaster so my case studies are based on this experience of khra now this is a backdrop location in kerala and central part of kerala was inundated with fury of the flood in 2018 and we have come to the picture of involving people students etc this is a backdrop to that one now i have mentioned about two case studies involving the domain number 5 of the intangible cultural heritage that is the traditional craftsmanship one example is a we call it a chernamangalam it is a village the yeah, resilient we call it a uh, uh, okay chernamangalam is a village of traditional handloom weaves in the ernakulam district of kerala where cotton textiles are woven by hand on frame looms all the three major cooperative weaving societies available in the village have suffered severe structural damage to the work sheds the handlooms the prelooms and postloom equipments all have been damaged during the uh, disaster the cotton yarn the semi finished textiles and finished textiles all have been spoiled beyond repair by the flooding however the positive things of resilient capacity of these people helped us to bring back to the business through their resilient community initiatives with help from professional agencies and ngos etc all that thing one of the things which has found out international recognition as a symbol of resilience is this doll made of cotton we call it che kutti the chennamangalam kutti means a small boy or girl the small boy from chennamangalam that is actually the most of the material were damaged we have mentioned earlier also so a few entrepreneurs like lakshmi menon and govi parayan brought this one the bought it and with the help of their uh, ngos built you can see the students and it's a, it is become a mass movement of making cut into the old pieces damaged pieces cut into small pieces and brought into a attractive dolls and that has become an international symbol and even un system it has entered as a symbol of resilience so that is a basically the original stakeholder the amount of the sale amount has gone to the original stakeholders that are, and they could survive another one craft community is gi tag aramula metal mirror works that also was extensively uh, damaged gi tag metal mirror called aramula kannadi is made by generations of a few families of highly skilled vishukarma goldsmiths in aramula village in patanandita district in kerala during the flood of 2018 about 25 there were around 25 only craft uh, community uh, families their units were destroyed 155 existing molds and the raw material for making molds to cast the mirrors were severely damaged the tools all the tools blow is the kin half finish or even finish pieces have all been destroyed again however because of the immense resilient capacity of the local community with help from ngos who helped them to come out they have survived and now came back to the business in a study on museums and covid 19 the international council of museums has suggested eight steps to community resilience concentrating on resilience and suggest that you are 
there are eight points need to be noted down. These include secure your own safety and well-being first. Try to focus on what you are doing best and seek alternate ways of doing. Monitor developments and changing societal needs. Remember that you are not alone. Keep in close contact with partners, collaborators, and community initiatives. Learn from the past. Consider the possibility of rapid response collecting and documenting the crisis and its impacts. Documentation of the crisis and online exhibitions are a solid feature. Capitalize on the experience. And finally, stay united and help the missing community. Now, the term resilient heritage, we call it resitage, has got its origin based on our field-oriented case studies and taking cue from the previous slide, ECOM, International Council of Museums, suggestion for community resilience, as well as the UNESCO-oriented suggestion of resilience. We have come up with the term uh, based on the case study. And UNESCO resilience is a global movement consisting of a series of virtual debates with key industry professionals and artists that raises awareness of the far-reaching impact of the COVID type of disaster or ended things on the culture sector. And the first Resili Art debate was launched in 2020, August, uh, April 15, on the occasion of the World Art Day. Similar Asia-oriented, South Asia-oriented Resili Art was also arranged many times in, in which many of the ICH members, Ananya, etc., have actively participated. So our, our days, and I have mentioned that the resili uh, art, that is the term they use, resilient art. So based on same similar resilient heritage. So we are shortened into a type of finally into resitage. It should have been resilient heritage or resilient uh, age, or for our convenience, we put it at resitage. And you can see the component part of this resilient art or re resitage. As well as we are concerned, has got three major component parts. We call it people, purpose, and process. The people involved, the fundamental, the primary stakeholders, primary, secondary, and tertiary ones. The purpose was immediately a short term result of survival and uh, reduction of the immediate damage. Whereas the process involved a revival, a long term revival using the technology of the digital. Uh, uh, opportunities which has opened up, e-workshop, etc. And so many of the agencies has helped us. So this uh, case studies has helped us to tame, uh, to give the time. And this time has been projected in uh, 2021, October e-commerce conference also. And what we envisage in, as a future for this research from our point of view, that we'll be concentrating on the community, craft community, and there is a proposal to develop a flood or in memories museum with the help of the Kerala Council for History Research and our uh, students from the university. And we are already helping out the resilient Chennamangalam, a conglomerate type of thing, a cooperative type of thing, etc. So many NGOs are, are available. Our young team, all NGOs are also helping out. But coming back to Bugo, you're all students of a university. Now we are going in our university. We have established a technology business incubator for art and craft, especially with the Department of Applied Art, which we call it Rupa Kalpana. It has been basically uh, uh, for developing, involving this type of textile, traditional textile community, and reviving their business with the academic community. That is one thing. Plus, coming into a university system of academics, we have established, we have already started the uh, first university oriented certificate course on intangible heritage in Kaladi. And now we are planning a more academic oriented disaster and resilient type of things as a certificate, university certificate course that's also coming up. Then future, we have got a, the university has established a network, UN university network in Asia Pacific with sustainable development as one of the key that one. And the university in which I work, Kaladi University, the second, the only second, the first one is Theri University, Theri, the Dame University, second, the Kaladi University. And just recently, the Aligarh Muslim University has uh, come into some uh, membership of the 
UN system called ProsperNet. That's the uh, network of Asian universities. So through that medium also, we will be projecting it, disseminating the knowledge about these activities. And the national level, definitely, we are already linked with Anand National University and the Jodhpur, the Rubai and Sanson, etc. And already we have committed an e-commerce mentoring project. We have already long, uh, involved disaster and museum resilient heritage type of things. So now my presentation, I have stopped for the time being. The small presentation, I thought the time didn't. Uh, so I had to rearrange my presentation into a short format, etc. Uh, thank you very much. Jay Hind. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> again, uh, I hope uh, the ideas which you have imparted to our participants will surely leave a mark and will help our attendees to delve further into researching uh, uh, heritage uh, rescue. So finally, uh, the Q&A session is open to all and we'll start taking questions from the audience. Uh, there are some of them uh, which are already there in the chat and I've seen that uh, Professor Olympia has been actively responding to a lot of them. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, but I'll uh, uh, open these questions to the other pan uh, panel members. So first is uh, <clears throat> by Asif, how can new online media and information technologies support the promotion of culture and art? This is a question which is by a student. So, if anybody would like to take a lead. Uh, can we start with Professor Olympia? Um, uh, oh. ma ma'am, I think. Hear me? Yes, ma'am, now I can hear no. you. Yes, yes, no. now, now yes. I can, now I can. Yes. Okay, good. Uh, I uh, replied these questions on the chat, yes, yes. but I consider very important uh, uh, many questions that I read in the chat um, because uh, there is uh, many important issues that we need uh, to, uh, to reflect for our future. All together, all together we need to reflect on this. And uh, I am very interested also to know the opinion from uh, other speakers about uh, it. Mm. Yes. Uh, so, uh, Una, ma'am, uh, like uh, the question is uh, that how can online media and information technologies support the promotion of culture and art? Uh, would you like to add something to it? In the last two years, the amount of information that has been exchanged across the world is phenomenal. In term, what it does is that we find commonalities. We find that issues that all of us are facing, some of them are pretty similar. And yet, because of our cultural context, we may be approaching them differently. This exchange helps us to find another way of looking at an issue, which is the key. And this appreciation of many cultures is really the need of the art. Finally, we have to realize we are all human beings across the world, whatever religion we may have, whatever cultural context we may be born in. And the planet earth is just one so in terms of media what is the role um, i'm glad that promotion of culture and art i think first we ourselves it's very important to seriously question what does culture and art mean to us so that we can then appreciate what it means to others and there, the medium which is uh, available to us, really, I mean, there is far too much of information that one can have, uh, actually, one can assimilate with the given time of 24 hours a day or 18 hours. That's my view on it. Uh, Professor Sudhirnan Murthy, sir. 
Uh, would you like to add something? Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, I think uh, as uh, highlighted by uh, Professor Olympia and also uh, architect uh, Poonam, um, that I think learning from the learning from various cultural contexts <clears throat> is going to be the key. Uh, it, it will be the key. Uh, that is the reason we are all meeting and uh, because we are looking at the larger level uh, planet Earth and larger level uh, uh, regions and zones, be it Asian context <clears throat> or uh, Indian context. Uh, so what is the need of uh, looking at uh, larger roles, uh, larger uh, regions and uh, places? And I was also mentioning to <clears throat> Professor uh, Olympia uh, that uh, a NARA document on authenticity has made a significant uh, uh, change in the perception of uh, localized ideas and local uh, perspectives on authenticity of uh, heritage, uh, and which is very much important and which speaks uh, uh, from the perspective of uh, people, uh, the local people, which recognizes the local uh, idea and local perception. I think uh, that is the key uh, for all of us in the profession and uh, be it professionals or citizens and people um, uh, learning from uh, various cultures, learning from uh, places is going to be the key for uh, uh, sustainable uh, uh, management of heritage. Thank you. Uh thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, Venuko Pal, sir, would you like to add something to it, please? Yeah, yeah. Definitely, because uh, we have been following the cases of uh, different stakeholders of ICH in Kerala, and we found that I mean, most of the people are senior people. They are not uh, very, uh, you, know, you can say, happy or let's say, proficient in the use of technology, latest technology and digital media. But luckily, for our one case study, puppetry, just two years uh, last year, uh, the Padma Sri winner, a person from Damchandra Pulavar, got Padma uh, Sri win for that one. And immediately, because he, uh, we know uh, that when we work that, and the, during the COVID period, whereas almost all other groups could not do any activity, he because because we, he was having two youth, uh, his uh, sons were proficient in the technology, and they helped with the help of this young, let's say knowledgeable IT oriented digital media, he could survive, and they could arrange so many type of international level. Uh, and he got that only the Padma Sri and using that chance also he utilized it continuously he oriented a webinar etc charging and he also helped us the student community also for this uh, workshop type of thing so and continued and that's a good case study of the people who may not be having uh, original knowledge of uh, latest technology in that one but with the help of young people who are proficient in this type of thing they could survive and they could even come out with the new things etc that is case study we could find out thank you very much thank you Thank you so much, sir. Uh, I think, uh, sir, uh, do you want to, uh, Sir Murthy, sir? Yes, would you like just, to uh, just I would like to add, yeah. uh, just uh, after listening to Mr. Venugopal, uh, uh, I would like to add uh, just a small point uh, that uh, um, uh, it needs uh, certainly uh, orientation and capacity building uh, of uh, people and also professionals. Uh, uh, especially those who are engaged in uh, uh, heritage management, urban planning, uh, place uh, planning. So they, and it requires a lot of capacity building programs to connect with intangible heritage. Intangible heritage, because most of our actions, when you are looking at physical heritage, you will be looking at physical, uh, uh, tangible heritage, and uh, you have methods and tools, but what are the methods and tools that you would incorporate when you want to integrate uh, uh, intangible heritage? Sure. So uh, the initiative taken up by Mr. Venugopal uh, uh, towards uh, giving uh, um, knowledge and also starting courses in intangible heritage connect uh, for heritage and uh, resilient management. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, so uh, we'll be taking one question, uh, which is, uh, uh, directed uh, towards architect Poonam Verma Mascarinus ma'am. Uh, 
uh, how do you see the demolition of 250 year old building to revive the life around one single heritage structure I'm going to sidestep this um, minefield by okay. saying that without a context of seeing which is this building, yeah. where is it, mm -hmm. and why it was done, mm -hmm. and around it, I shall not comment. Of course. Uh, so we'll be mostly taking questions which have not been answered, and uh, I think uh, a lot of them have been answered by the uh, uh, by the speakers so that we can just, uh, uh, as uh, we have been overrunning a little bit. Uh, there's a question by Himant, which is, uh, I, he would like to know that can people or uh, uh, consider films as part of their intangible cultural heritage? I think a lot of students are very interested with digital medium and would like to know that if films can be a part of intangible heritage, cultural heritage. Uh, like uh, Shole, is it? Oh yes, Shole <laughs> is is definitely intangible cultural heritage of India, the biggest one. Yeah. So yeah, short answer is films, but what kind of films? Yeah, definitely. It always anything that records. I'm going to just go and jump in because uh, let's just go fast. And I think it's also we overlook it because they capture the social. Um, whatever i mean mother india onwards and there are people there is there used to be a program on films on dd um, in ancient era about how the films have been in which era and what kind of subjects and and they have become an access now for us to know mm -hmm. what was happening then if you go into the the beginning of the cinematic uh, you know whether it's not just that charlie chaplin is is this where world known for nothing and the kind of the speech on whatsapp that moves around from his uh, one of his clips where he is dressed as a as um, our hitler and what he talks about that speech in itself the content of that speech yeah yeah so i would say in fact, movies, more new movies are being made. And the recent one, I would strongly urge everyone just to see Coral Woman. It is available free on YouTube. You just, and please watch it on television and then see the power of movies. It is about environment. It is about corals. Should I write it or will uh, it be enough? Coral Woman. I'll just check it on the on chat YouTube, so that you just, just just write coral woman this is a movie to watch and then you get to know and so yes movies is anything I mean it's a very any media which conveys your um, anguish I mean and paintings and crafts and arts and it's it's about the conveying the the <laughs> thought is important what it conveys Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, Professor Olympia, uh, Professor uh, uh, Surinayan Murthy ji, if you would like to add something, I think. Uh, Professor Olympia, would you like to add something to the question uh, about films? Uh, can the films be regarded as intangible cultural heritage of any uh, society? This is a, an important topic because uh, now uh, all intangible heritage define the knowledge of the people and uh, I consider that uh, an important heritage we, didn't, we need to preserve uh, is the first heritage the knowledge of the people to understand also um, the best way to um, uh, restore, to preserve uh, the, our, our heritage. Now I, I reply also another question in the chat uh, because uh, um, this question introduces another interesting topic about uh, the uh, urban restoration. Um, the, I don't know, I don't know the, the authors of these questions, but um, um, this friend introduced another important topic in a relationship 
we yeah. did the intangible heritage, we did the intangible intended with the intangible the knowledge, the ancient knowledge um, of uh, our uh, specific culture, because I consider very important to reflect about these issues in a dialogue with the local culture, with the local uh, heritage. Uh, it is impossible today uh, and also UNESCO now um, work in uh, this uh, direction. Um, we need uh, we uh, need to work on the local heritage, not on the global heritage, not on the global definition, but uh, all um, specific in specific relationship with the local culture, with the local needs, and also these questions introduce very well at this topic and I consider also very important to reflect all together uh, in the, um, also on this topic on um, the re urban restoration because all today this is, is another important topic. Yeah, yeah I think I take this uh, <clears throat> another uh, opportunity to address this uh, what has been mentioned by Professor Olympia on uh, local culture and uh, local uh, um, because not on the global global heritage and global culture see what we, we what we need to understand is uh, there will be a uh, lot of uh, uh, literature and documents that keep emerging at the global level from unesco and uh, world heritage center and uh, many other uh, resources as a global perspective uh, uh, but uh, the main important thing is what we take action and what we perceive and how do we react and act locally uh, is going to be more important and that is going to be encouraged. Uh, like uh, historic urban landscapes approach uh, as prescribed by uh, uh, UNESCO uh, is uh, looks at uh, global perspective, but that has to be locally exercised locally understood locally whether that that uh, that is the only way to look at cultural landscapes or will there be some japanese uh, way of looking at it indian way of looking at it as highlighted by professor rana pebi singh as highlighted by professor olympia so that local perspective is going to be local people perspective is going to be central to uh, our uh, actions to define uh, globally, uh, so there are people who will define globally, but most important thing is that locally, we shall not be carried away by this global advoca advocation and advocacy and global uh, literature. Uh, we need to be very much vigilant and aware of what exists locally as a knowledge and idea knowledge system about our heritage. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think uh, regarding the film as an uh, audiovisual, naturally the sector, the, the documentation of audiovisual is an important component part accepted worldwide for safeguarding of the intangible We have got a classic example of one agency called uh, Sahabedia using it extensively. Right? So it's a tool for safeguarding of intangible entity. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, I think uh, rest of the questions, uh, we'll collect all the questions and uh, we'll mail it to our speakers so that uh, if, when they have time, uh, they will be able to uh, respond to those questions as we have been uh, overrunning our time. So, uh, for now, I would like to thank uh, all of the participants for asking so many questions with their uh, perspectives and uh, trying to get uh, answers regarding their queries. And I would like to invite Dr. Harsimran Kaur to please address our speakers and audience for the closing remarks. Thank you so much, Akhil. Um, first and foremost, I would like to express my appreciation to all the distinguished speakers for their valuable contribution to our distinguished lecture on sharing perspectives for climate risk preparedness using intangible cultural heritage as a knowledge resource. This program was organized specifically for the graduate students commemorating the 41st International Day for Monuments and Sites. My deepest gratitude goes to all who attended the program and helped make it a successful event. The program has been very effective in meeting its purpose, which was to understand the relationship between cultural heritage, 
climate action, resilience, and risk preparedness. The potential of heritage needs to be seen from a broad sense to foster social cohesion, inclusion, equality, collective action, communities association with a place and its ecology, and most importantly, as a knowledge resource from our shared history. This open lecture program was organized for graduate students of architecture, design, cultural studies, history, geography, and aligned fields of study as an outreach program to build awareness and interest of students to actively connect with the professionals and practitioners in the field of heritage. Our speakers discuss the various impacts of climate change on our cultural heritage. The rich and diverse presentations of the program have shown that culture is crucial, yet dramatically neglected dimension of sustainability. More research will be necessary to assess local impacts of climate change, analysis risk, and better capture the relevance of socioeconomic factors. At the same time, we have to broaden our view and rework our concepts in describing and analyzing cultural heritage. To conclude, I would like to say that the future of heritage conservation can only be achieved through a careful consideration of the ever-changing environment around us. Thank you very much and namaskar. Now, I would like to hand over to architect Akhil Navani for the vote of thanks. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, finally, uh, I would like to present a vote of thanks to all the people who have been a part of this program. I, uh, on behalf of my colleagues and the entire community, first of all, uh, uh, give my utmost and sincere thanks to all the various people who have given their vital time for, from their busy schedule, and especially to our speakers to impart us with such uh, uh, knowledge. Uh, I would like to place my hearty thanks to ICOMOS India, uh, for collaborating with us through NSC ICH, which is National Scientific Community on Intangible Cultural Heritage, and NSCCL, National Scientific Community on Cultural Landscape, as our knowledge partner. It is due to such collaborations which have made uh, this program possible. And finally, I would like to thank all our participants who are present here. And because of you, this program has been a success. Uh, thank you. Namaskar. Have a great day ahead.